happening. Uh, Daryl says he's ready. So we're going to be uh, beginning with a prayer, if you would, please, before we get into our study on Psalm 122. Father, we do thank you for the stay and the blessings you've given us. We thank you, Father, that we are able to gather together in the house that you have brought together. We thank you for the household of faith that it meets here, Father, that has a desire to worship and praise you and give thanksgiving for all that you have done, for all that you are, Father, that you are sovereign over all things that have come about. And, Father, you're bringing all things about to the point where Jesus will uh, be uh, king on this earth. We thank you, Father, for the salvation that was wrought through Jesus' blood on the cross, uh, that he is a risen Father, and, uh, and uh, one day we, Father, will all also arise and be in your very presence and will be there, Father, not because of anything that we have done, but because of the sacrifice that he has made on the cross. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father for being such a joy and encouragement to us and how you care for us. And Father, give us peace in trying times. Thank you for the many blessings you continue to shower upon us. Be with us as we even look into your word this morning. And Father, we thank you and praise you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in Psalm 122. It is a psalm of ascents. And we've discussed, uh, starting in... Uh, Psalm 120, that there are 15 psalms of ascents. It, were the, it is believed generally that these are psalms or songs that were sung by the Hebrew pilgrims as they went up to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, they went up to worship the Lord God in Jerusalem, the city of God, where the throne of David was established, where the temple was built, where the people of God gathered uh, three times a year as was prescribed by the law, that they should go up. But the, this was not just a, a ritual or something that they were required to do. It was something that was to be a heartfelt desire to go up to, the, to Jerusalem, to go up to the temple of the Lord, and to worship him, to sit, offer uh, sacrifices of thanksgiving to him for all that he has done. There was a recognition that God is sovereign over all things, and he has prescribed for things to have happened in the nation of Israel. This was a time for the people to go up to Israel, uh, go up to Jerusalem to pray, to celebrate, to joyously come into the house of the Lord and worship him who is worthy. And we've started the Psalms of Ascent in Psalm 120, and there was a prayer there for the deliverance from treacherous or evil men, and an understanding from the psalmist there that the Lord answers the cry of his people. In Psalm 121, it says the Lord is the keeper or the protector or the guardian of Israel, and the psalmist there understood, it causes us to understand that our help comes from him. Psalm 122 is about the joyful journey, the destination of God's people at this time. It's written by Daniel, pardon me, it is not written by Daniel, it is written by David. And I'm going to say a few things about David because I think the perspective of understanding and remembering who David was and what, how God worked in his life is important. And I think it would come to mind by the Hebrew pilgrim as they were going up to Jerusalem, as they were going up to the temple, as they were going up and seeing the palace or the throne of the king of Israel, as they went up to the city of God. So we're going to take a look at that by beginning with uh, David being considered the author of Psalm 122. Well, I'm going to go ahead and read Psalm 122. Uh, in my uh, scripture, it says it's a prayer for the peace of Jerusalem, a song of ascents of David. I was glad when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem that is built as a city that is compact together, to which, go, to which the tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord, an ordinance for Israel. For their, 
For there thrones were set up for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will say now, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord your God, I will seek your good. A psalm of David, a psalm of ascents. We already know the people are going up to Jerusalem to worship. I think I mentioned before, if you're traveling anywhere in Israel, uh, when you go to Jerusalem, you are going up to Jerusalem. And the fact is, when you get there, you're still able in, on entry into the city to still look up and see uh, the things that God has caused to become true. It's a psalm of David. And I, I could not help but consider the things of David, the history of David, and what went on in David's life because it was all directed by the Lord. He looked to the Lord. He had a heart for the Lord. His desire was for the Lord. And we'll see uh, in the end, uh, toward the end of this that David's desire, after all of the wars, all of the battles that he fought, his desire, uh, being at peace in the land, was to build the house of the Lord. And the answer to, from the Lord was no. If we went to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and other parts in Scripture, we see beginning in uh, verse 6 and going on through to verse 18, uh, what, uh, what was said about David. Uh, we know that he was a son of Jesse. We know that Saul, the first king of Israel, fell out of favor by the Lord, and the Lord decided the next king of Israel would be David, son of Jesse, a Bethlehemite. And uh, God goes to Samuel, tells Samuel, I need you to go to Bethlehem, to Jesse, the house of Jesse, and anoint his son, the next king of Israel. Peculiar thing since Saul was still king at the time. But that is what God gave as, a, as the, the, the thing for Samuel to do. Samuel, what does he do? He goes to Bethlehem. He goes to the family of Jesse. He says, gather your children. Actually, gather your sons. I need to see. I want to pronounce a blessing on your sons. And they line up seven of eight sons. And Samuel walks up to the first one, looks at him. Because obviously, I would, I would think they are lined up by order of age, the eldest first. Uh, that would be the, the traditional way for the, uh, the Hebrew to look at their, their children of prominence, the eldest first going down to the youngest. Seven sons. And Samuel looks at the first one and says, I think this is the guy. Look at big strapping young man, handsome. And the Lord says, no. The second man, no. Third, no. Fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, no, no, no. Caused Samuel to be a little confused, but he doesn't, he doesn't lack faith. He knows God called him to anoint a son of Jesse as the next king of Israel. So his question to Jesse is, is this all your children? And the answer is, no. I've got one more, but he's young. He's out tending the sheep. He's a shepherd. Uh, how coincidental, <laughs> coincidental. Uh, what a way for God to have a type of Jesus Christ in David. David being a shepherd and Jesus Christ becoming the good shepherd of the people of Israel. David's out tending the flocks, doing what he should be doing because for his father. They bring David in, Samuel looks at him, and the Lord says, this is he. Simple enough, Samuel anoints David to be uh, king after Saul. And there is a time that uh, Saul as king is beset by an evil spirit. I, I forgot something. Uh, at the time David was anointed to be king, it says 
that David came in and he was ruddy, he had beautiful eyes, he was handsome in appearance, that we know that the Lord doesn't look on outward appearances, but at the heart, we know David had a heart after God because God says so and later in Scripture. This is he, and it says at that point, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David. At the same time, the Spirit of the Lord left Saul. Doesn't mean he had to, but he did. And Saul was beset by an evil spirit that caused him all kinds of confusion and turmoil and unrest. And the counselors of Saul decided what Saul needed was somebody to play soothing music to him. And we have soothing music over here. Sometimes we have really exciting music over here. I appreciate every bit of it. But there was a soothing type of music that would ease Saul's pain and his his uh, disturbance, and here I'm going to say coincidentally, we know there are no coincidences with God, one of the young men in Saul's entourage said, I have seen a son of Jesse, uh, the Bethlehemite, who is a skilled musician, a mighty man of valor, powerful, able, a warrior, one prudent in speech, and handsome. Most of all, says and the Lord is with him. So we know that there is something that came about in David's life. People began to recognize him as having these attributes, this character of being a a warrior, being valiant, of being prudent in speech, of being a skillful musician. David wrote a great number of the Psalms himself. So he, we know he was a musician, both in composition as well as in playing. So David goes to play the harp for Saul whenever he is beset by an evil spirit. We don't know how long that went on or how many times it happened. We just know God's word tells us it did. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, it says David was called on again, so he wasn't in Saul's presence at this time. He was back at home tending the sheep. He was being a shepherd again, doing what his father called him to do. And his father sent for him and said, you've got three brothers in the army of Saul. They're battling the Philistines. I need you to go up and take them some supplies. Not only his three brothers, but also their commander. They need provisions to be able to be in the battle and at war with the Philistines. We know David does exactly what his father says, gets a cart, takes it, is going up into the valley. He hears an uproar. He runs ahead. And he's able to witness Goliath coming out on the opposite hillside, taunting and mocking the army of God, saying, send me a champion. Send me one guy that will do battle with me, and we'll call this battle according to what comes about. And everyone in Saul's army is fearful. But it's David, David the young shepherd, who comes and says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would taunt the army of the living God? He was not looking at circumstances of being just a shepherd boy and Goliath being nine feet tall and and armor so heavy an ordinary man couldn't carry it. He wasn't afraid of that at all. And he said that he would go up and battle Goliath. We know that. He did go up to battle. And the reason that he said he would do that is because the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. He didn't look to his own power, his own might. He looked to the Lord God to be the one who would take the needed uh, victory over Goliath. And we know David... uh, David, uh, has victory over Goliath. He kills Goliath. He's applauded and, uh, and praised. Saul makes him a commander of his armies. He goes out in further battles. And he's a man of bloodshed because he goes at war so often doing what God has him to do because it, it was not that he wasn't supposed to do it. It was God had these things for David to do. We know that uh, Saul and his sons, including Jonathan, who would be the next 
heir to the kingdom, were killed in battle. We know they were killed in battle, and David is made king over Judah. And we see that in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Pardon me, 2 Samuel chapter 2. He's made king of Judah. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, he's made king over Israel. So David becomes king over Judah and Israel. He continues fighting the battles with the Gentile peoples in the land. This is David. Uh, he, he's named king. He becomes king at 30 years old. He reigns as king for 40 years. Many battles, many wars much bloodshed. The land is, after a long period of time, at peace. And David wants to build the house of the Lord. It's in his heart to do that. But God says, no, you will not. Instead, his son Solomon was tasked with building the temple. In Psalm 122, verse 1, it says, I was glad when they said, let us go up to the house of the Lord. I can understand David exhibiting a gladness. It's a cheerfulness. It's a happiness. It's an encouragement and exalting. And David was encouraged and exalted to go into the house of the Lord. And we know that David was not there when the temple was built. But he was there to have built the tabernacle in which the Ark of the Covenant resided. And whether we consider that the house or not, and I'm going to bring up a little bit here that says this, the temple was so much in David's mind that he understood what it would mean to go into the house of the Lord. But uh, whether we consider it the tabernacle for David or whether he was prophetically looking forward to the temple being built and understanding the people would say they are going to be glad. Personally, individually, there's a, to be a gladness, a happiness, a joy for going into the house of the Lord. Uh, this was true of uh, the Hebrew pilgrims. It was true of David. This should be true of us. You know, when we come into to church, we know that where two or three are gathered in his name, he's present with us. We should be joyful. We should be encouraged. We should be uh, have a heartfelt joy. We should be cheered by the idea of coming in and being with God's people and worshiping the Lord God. Let us go up to the house of the Lord. There's an understanding that it's not just an individual that's made happy by this, but there's a fellowship. For Israel, it was a fellowship of all of the tribes of Israel and all of the people of Israel, and the recognition that each individual person is to be cheered and joyful, and all of them together should cheer and encourage one another about being able to go up into the house of the Lord. Again, we know that David was not allowed to build the temple, but his son Solomon was tasked with doing so. And if we go to 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 22, verse 11, starting, this just boggles my mind to some extent. And David was so so ready to build the, the, the house of the Lord, and he was told no, but it didn't stop him from planning to build the temple. It didn't stop him from gathering materials to build the temple. It didn't stop him from gathering resources and gold and silver and bronze and, and uh, iron and uh, timber. David was all about, let's get this house of the Lord built. The, whole, the Lord deserves it. Can the Lord be constrained or bound in, in a house? No. God created everything that there is. He can't be bound in a house. But David's desire was to do this for the people of Israel, that they would know that there was a God in heaven. Second Chronicles, uh, First Chronicles, chapter 22, starting in verse 11. He's speaking to Solomon about what Solomon needs to do in terms of the temple. He says, Now, my son, the Lord be with you, that you may be successful and build the house of the Lord your God just as he has spoken concerning you. Only the Lord give you discretion and understanding and give you charge over Israel so that you may keep the law of the Lord. Then you shall prosper if you are careful to observe the statutes and the ordinances which the Lord commanded Moses concerning Israel. Be strong and courageous. 
do not fear nor be dismayed. And here's where it starts boggling my mind. It's, uh, now behold, with great pains, I have prepared. And David took effort, a great deal of effort, to bring together the necessary materials for the building of the temple. He said, I have prepared for the house of the Lord 100,000 talents of gold, 1 million talents of silver, and bronze and iron beyond weight, for they are in great quantity. Also timber and stone I have prepared, and you may add to them if you wish, but he's already prepared for them to be used. Moreover, there are many workmen with you, stone cutters and masons, and stone, uh, masons of stone and carpenters, and all men who are skillful in every kind of work, of the gold and the silver and the bronze and the iron, there is no limit. Arise and work, and may the Lord be with you. David also commanded the leaders of Israel to help with uh, Solomon, saying, Is not the Lord your God with you? Has he not given you rest on every side? For he has given the inhabitants of the land into my hand, and that land is subdued before the Lord, before his people. Most important, now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise, therefore, and build the sanctuary. Uh, David was intent on getting the house of the Lord built. He understood he could not do it, but he charged his son Solomon to do so. Um, uh, along with that charge to build the temple, in 2 Samuel 7, 712 it said the Lord told David when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever not just for the lifetime of Solomon forever David and Solomon's throne was to be established your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. So Nathan the prophet spoke to David. And there's the understanding of the Davidic covenant. God has determined that David's line, David's uh, lineage is going to continue on. And that there is a how you could believe that the Lord was going to keep that line, that kingdom together forever probably boggled David's mind. I, forever? How do you do that? How is that accomplished? David believed it was going to happen. We believe it has happened through Jesus Christ, the greater son of David, the one who will sit on David's throne, who will sit on the throne of Israel, who will rule forever. I was. I read the uh, Second Chronicles about the uh, the talents. <laughs> it was a hundred thousand talents of gold, uh, the, a talent, and I, I got various answers looking at various places. This is a, a talent was either between sixty-five to seventy-five pounds. We're talking about a hundred thousand pounds of gold. Oh, pardon me, a hundred thousand talents of gold which would be 650 to 750,000 pounds of gold. And I tried to do the math, and I'm sorry. It just confused me. The numbers get so large, it's confused. One million talents of silver. I, I mean, uh, when I did it on my calculator, it comes up with an exponential number, 10 to the fourth times tw I, the number boggles my mind. But as David said, you know, the silver and gold and uh, bronze and, and iron, it's limitless. We have more than enough. I went back and looked at the tabernacle. The tabernacle, it says, uh, was built with 29 talents of gold. That's 34,000, roundabout, 34,800 pounds of gold. 17 tons. God gave this to David. 
God allowed David to accrue all of this, to have it available for Solomon to build the temple. So David, in writing in Psalm 122, if I was singing this psalm, I'm thinking of David and everything that God did through him and for him and for the nation of Israel for his own sovereign goodwill and pleasure. And that is why David would say, I was glad when they said, let us go up to the house of the Lord. We need to have that same understanding, that same feeling of coming into the house of God. To be able to worship individually, to praise God individually, but to be in the midst of God's people and to fellowship with them. To be able to be in the, the word of God, to study it, to understand it. We need to be able to pray with God's people. We need to be able to sing and uh, play music that is uplifting and encouraging and causes us to think and to worship God. We need to be praising him and being thankful for all that he has given. These kind of thoughts would be going through the mind of the Hebrew pilgrim on the way to Jerusalem to worship at the prescribed times. Psalm 122, verse 2, our feet are standing within your gates, Jerusalem. Uh, David's perspective here in writing the psalm and that to be played or sung by the, uh, the Hebrew pilgrims is a, uh, their journey is long. It's arduous. It's dangerous. And they come to the gates of the city of Jerusalem, and they're standing in the gates. You can't help but think that the people have a sense of awe and wonder at the city of Jerusalem, just being in the place that is God's city. They're standing within the gates, considering everything that is there, all of the, all of the, the uh, streets, the houses, up to the pinnacle of the, the Temple Mount, where the palace of, uh, uh, where David's palace was, where the Temple of God was, just, I mean, I haven't been there. I want to go. I want to see. I want to see how the, the, uh, the pilgrims that are here to be singing these songs would think about entering Jerusalem, God's city. Verse, one, verse 3, Jerusalem has been built as a city that is compacted together. It's a, it was firmly founded. It was joined together. It was bound together. It was closely fitted. I, it wasn't a large city. And the outskirts of the wall and, and encircled it. So all of the all of the houses within it are compact, built firmly. It says they're bound tightly. And then in verse four it says, "To which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, and an ordinance for Israel." There's an understanding that each individual tribe would be going up. Uh, individuals from every tribe of of Israel would be going up to worship the Lord. But they were all going up to a common place to worship their common God. I don't want to say common God, their sovereign Lord and God. Uh, they were going up to worship Yahweh, the loyal, loving, covenant-keeping God of Israel, the creator of all things. And just as the city itself was built and, and held firmly and bound firmly together, it was understood that the tribes of Israel shouldn't be separate entities. And of course, there's always tribal conflicts, but they should be coming together, bound together by the belief and understanding of a Lord God, Yahweh, who was their God. And they were going together to worship him. Wow, I... There to go up and offer these sacrifices uh, three times a year. It's, uh, it says the city is bound firmly together. In the verse before, they were to go up to worship him. In verse 4, it says there's an ordinance for all of Israel to go up to, to worship God. Uh, if we looked at Deuteronomy 16:16, 16, 16, there are three prescribed times to go up every year to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, God's desire was that his people would come together and worship that they would look to him and understand that anything and all of the blessings that they have come from him. 
The feasts that they were to go up for were the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles, or Feast of Booths. And I am not going to have enough time to go into each of those. Those are, those are an entire study by themselves. God prescribed that they would go up. He prescribed that they would, they would worship in this way, that they would gather together, that they would be bound tightly, unified together as a people of God. You know, just as the, the Israelite tribes were there to worship their creator God, you know, we come together as a church also. And we should be bound tightly together. We're bound by Jesus Christ and our unity in him. Uh, we look to him as fulfilling and becoming that greater son of David, that savior. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to save his people from their sin. God in his mercy has reached out and even grafted in the people that were outside of his nation of Israel. Uh, thankfully, Probably all of us sitting in this room are grafted into God's blessings that are intended for the nation of Israel. We are allowed through the blood of Jesus Christ to be joined in, tightly knit together, bound to one another. And we'll look at Ephesians and what that means, being bound together as a church body. Uh, maybe toward the end, I'm going to lose my time. There's a recognition in verse 5 uh, in this psalm, in this song, that not only was Jerusalem the place of worship of a holy and righteous God, it was also the place of the civil government. This is where David reigned. This is where the, the line of David reigned in Jerusalem, and they were put in place by God. Uh, there were thrones, and they were set up to be places of judgment. Israel, and especially Jerusalem, was to be a place of or a city of justice, where good was honored and where evil is corrected, and was done so according to the word of God. This is what they were looking to, to be able to worship a God who brought them peace within the land, who brought them a governing authority over them as a body, who had a temple that was, they could come to and worship him. Their desire was to be... Uh, in a place that was just and right and righteous. And that could only be found in the auspices of, a, of the Lord God, Yahweh. David was the first king of Israel to reside in Jerusalem. He was the first king to rule in Jerusalem. He was the king that desired to be, have a heart after God, and he was, a, he was the king that wanted to build the temple of the Lord. He was a righteous king. His lineage was going to continue forever, and that, is, uh, that it was determined by the Lord himself, and it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is yet to come as king. He is king, but ruling on this earth, he is yet to come. You know, in uh, Mark chapter 12, verses 35 to 37, it says that uh, Jesus was teaching the people, and the people enjoyed listening to him uh, speak. It says they, they had heard words from Jesus they had never, uh, never heard before because he understood Scripture. He understood the meanings of Scripture. And he was correcting the, fat, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. In Mark 12, 35 to 37, Jesus began by saying, as he taught in the temple area, how is it that the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet? David called this person my Lord. How is he then David's son? How is it? How is it? We see this also presented in Psalm 110. It says the, the crowds were it enjoyed, they were in awe of, Dave, of uh, Jesus' understanding of Scripture. And uh, they understood that David prophetically was speaking of the coming Messiah, the Lord of all things, the one that would be king on the throne of David, his son, 
and he would rule forever. We'll say more about that in a little bit. Uh, verses 6, 7, and 8 of Psalm 122. Pray or ask urgently for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. You know, we could look at uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Uh, where God tells Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. There's a fulfillment, and we understand from these three verses that the peace is prayed for for the people of God. Urgently, we're to seek God for his peace. Our peace, though, comes from knowing Jesus Christ. Verse 7, may peace be within your walls and prosperity within your, plas your palaces. I mean, God's uh, blessing of peace comes with prosperity. Verse 8, for the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. Uh, the desire of David to, in this psalm is for the people to understand and know that they need to be praying, but they need to be praying for peace, and it needs to be the peace that comes from God. God will provide blessings. God does provide blessings. He provides it to all the, uh, the people of Israel and when they find peace with him. He provides peace with us through Jesus Christ, his son. We are blessed by God and David recognizes this and wants to put this to song so that the people can sing it as they just consider all of these things going up to Jerusalem to worship God. Verse 9, for the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. There's an understanding here that uh, uh, God calls us to be at peace with all men, especially the household of faith. That's for the church. But it is also true for the nation of Israel, for the sake of the Lord God, they were to be testifying to, the God, to God's mercy and grace uh, for his peace that is given to his people. And there should come out of that, come out of the heart of those who are his own, should come out a desire to be for the good of those around them. Uh, we're... Of course, we do good according to God's word. There's going to be a certain amount of animosity toward us for desiring to do good according to God's word. We are called to do that. We're to be called to be at peace with God and to seek everyone's good. Our peace comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. David looked for this and the, the one who would reign on his throne forever. Uh, we know when the, uh, uh, we know how Jesus was described in the New Testament. In Matthew uh, 20, uh, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21 says, but Joseph, thinking about uh, Mary and her condition, was thinking this over, and behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who is conceived in you has been conceived by the Holy Spirit, shall give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." This is so that the word of the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. We're so privileged to know and understand that Jesus is that Messiah who came, the one who will be king and reign on David's throne forever. And he gives us peace with God. And what, was the, what were the Magi looking for when they came to Herod? traveling maybe for as much as two years to get to uh, Jerusalem. And they go to Herod's court, and what did they say? Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? They're asking this question of Herod, the king of the Jews. They know there was one 
that would be born king of the Jews. And not only that, Herod understands this is talking about the Messiah. He goes on, he says, uh, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And gathering together the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where is the Messiah going to be born? Well, he understood when they were looking for the one that was going to be born king, that that was the Messiah. He joined the two together. And they said in Bethlehem of Judea. And this is where Christ was born. And out of Bethlehem, uh, it was stated by the prophet, from you will come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Jesus fulfilled and became the peace of God as being the greater son of David, the one who will be ruler, who will be king, who will shepherd his people. We, are, we get to see and look back in Scripture and understand how things were fulfilled in Scripture through Jesus Christ. Uh, at David's time, and at the time these, the Hebrew pilgrims were making pilgrimage to Jerusalem, they were looking forward to this time. They were looking forward to the Messiah, and over the years they became uh, confused and, and forgot that Jesus was not only the son of David, he was going to be the son of God. They looked for a political ruler. They, they wanted somebody to overthrow Rome. They didn't understand or, or think about him being the one to be worshipped because he was born king and he was the Messiah. If we go to Ephesians 2 and we think about an application to the church, uh, Ephesians 2 verse 17 uh, it says, and he came and he preached peace to you who were far away. This is the Gentiles. This is us who have been uh, uh, grafted into the body of, uh, of Christ. Uh, he said, you were far away and, and, and peace to those who were near. For through him, Jesus Christ, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you have our fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the, in whom the whole building being fitted together and growing into a holy temple to the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Uh, using the very language of Psalm 122. It's being fitted together, bound together, united together with Jesus Christ. We are being that done. We are being bound together, united into one body. And it's a temple to the Lord God. If we go to, if we go to Ephesians 4, verses 14 to, I put 14 to 16, it may be more than that. Mm-hmm says, as a result, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed about uh, and here and there by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness of deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every saint is supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. We're being fitted together. You know, when, the, when the psalmist David considered Jerusalem and how it was fitted together, bound together, when he considered the tribes of Israel, how they were separate tribes, but all bound together by their love of the Lord God, Yahweh, their covenant-keeping, loving, gracious Father. So we as a church are bound together by Jesus Christ, and we're fitted together as a body uh, to be a, a, a body that represents Jesus Christ in this world. And we can only be thankful for all of these things. I know I've been trying to, to break off by 
35 or 40 minutes after, but I, I don't seem to be able to do it. Um, I'm going to pray, and then if you have any questions or thoughts, you want to talk to me privately, that would be fine as well. Father, we thank you for this time you've given that we might worship you, that we might look into your word and know and understand more about you and understand, Father, how you worked in the lives of your people Israel, even through the life of David, your king, who you put on the throne in Israel, in Jerusalem, how, Father, you're, you are, have a heart for your people. And, Father, it extends to us in the church through the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been grafted in. We are bound and united together, Father, understanding that our salvation comes only by him, only by his sacrifice on the cross, only, Father, because you are Lord and God. You are sovereign over all things. We thank you that you've drawn us to him. You've caused us to know and understand him as Savior. You've caused us to understand our need for him. Thank you, Father. And we pray that you continue uh, to guide and direct our steps, that we may know you better, that we may love you more. And that, Father, we might be saying one to another, uh, Father, let us go up into the house of the Lord. May we do it joyfully with excitement. May we have fellowship one with another, Father. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.